Scooby-Doo and the Witch's Ghost is a 1999 American direct-to-video sequel to the 1998 Zombie Island. Normally, direct-to-video sequels are bad, but all four films were done that way, so it's not any trouble here. Director Jim Stenstrom, along with writers Glenn Leopold and Davis Doy, returned from the prior film with the additions of Rick Kopp and David Goodman. Those last two being added were viewed as insults to the original crew. See, Zombie Island was meant to be an experimental one-off, but due to its surprise success, Warner Brothers ordered a second film. However, Warner Brothers suits did what all suits do. They got more hands-on. The freedom of the original product was scaled back and much more monitored. Luckily, animation was still handled by MOOC Studios in Japan, so we all know it will look good. This town shall pay! This film follows the mystery in Gang to Oak Haven, New England, where reports of a witch's ghost have surfaced. There, they'll have to deal with more than a few oddities. Ghosts, witches, goth rocker chicks, and Tim Curry. Honestly, sounds pretty good. Delicious. Our tale starts off at the end of a caper. The usual stuff happens, with jokes, monsters, and a surprise guest. No problem, Freddy. But like, we had a little help. Voiced by Tim Curry, who gives a really solid performance. But what was he doing here? I was doing research on my latest novel. He's also here for Velma to gush over, and invite the gang to his sleepy little hometown of Oakhaven. What? I thought you said this was a quiet little town. That is, if your idea of sleepy is a town that never sleeps. Just what the hell is going on? Well, Mayor Corey, voiced by Neil Ross, who some of my viewers may recognize from that time he went looking for that philosopher's legacy. This film must have been a reunion of Mel Gear focused people, as McKnight here is voiced by Peter Renaday, who voiced Richard Ames in Mel Gear Solid 2. Mel Gear Solid, the franchise that persists in following me no matter what avenue I take. Anyways, back in Oakhaven, it's revealed that while constructing a ye old village, the spirit of Sarah Ravencroft has come back to haunt them. Something Ben Ravencroft doesn't take too well. That's ridiculous. I thought we'd gotten past all this witch nonsense. Well, come on, Ben. The mayor here knows a thing or two about ghosts from back in the day. Checking out the Puritan village, Velma spills a little history. Just like the Salem witch trials, many men and women who were a bit different or didn't conform to the codes of the colony suffered the same fate. Or some attention star bitches started pointing fingers, and there's also some clan disputes going on. Look, I'm just saying, the Crucible's creation was made on a lie. There were confirmed commies. Anyway, Scooby gets into a fight with a gopher, managing to win Shaggy a ye old shoe buckle. Like, look for another one, Scoob, so I can have a match in pair. And as you may have noticed, that is not Billy West. He was busy working on a little show called Futurama. Here we have the first time that Scooby VA, Scott Eanes, would take over the role. Back in the day, Scott Eanes was a radio host, and they would pay homage to that down the line. Hey, Scoob, you want to hear my radio voice? Like, put down your snow shovel and pick up that thin air guitar. It's time to stay in and rock on. Well, with all the digging that happened, Ben asked for the journal of his ancestor, which he knows will clear her name. They got nothing. Just like they got nothing in their stomach, which Shaggy and Scoob are able to fix on Ben's dime. Something tells me when he sees the bill, he'll be able to have a nice long chat with his ancestor. This introduces us to Jack, voiced by Bob Joles, who, yes, continues the Metal Gear Solid connections, as he voiced random PMC soldiers in MGS4. Back with the rest of the gang, they get the tour of the Ravencroft estate, including a ye olde depiction of Sarah Ravencroft. Come nightfall and the dynamic duo is stuffed like Thanksgiving turkey. Time to turn that food into muscle as the ladies of the night are out and about. I'm intrigued, but I'll keep the masquerade up. You, you have a nice day. As if hot goth vampire chicks isn't enough, there's even a witch flying around. Only spell she seems to know is fireball. Must have gotten rusty from being in the dirt for the last century. Again, let me say that the animation is great. These films have aged very well, and the witch looks fucking awesome. The gang investigates for clues and manages to find something. Hey, check out these branches. They were all broken from the tops of these trees. And in a perfectly straight line. I mean, come on, Fred. There's a town festival going on. It's called trimming. 
I'd cut to a Manscaped ad if I had one, but I don't. What I do have, however, is one of the most memorable things about this film, as sounds and lights lead the group to the Hex Girls. Mix it up here in my little bowl. Say a few words and you lose control. Thorn, voiced by Jennifer Hale, Luna, voiced by Kimberly Brooks, and Dusk, voiced by Jane Wieldlin. Those first two did appear in MGS, with Hale voicing Naomi and Brooks random NPCs. The funniest thing to learn while researching this film was that religious groups actually opposed the fictional band's inclusion, quote, of the devil, luring young girls into Wicca witchcraft. No, I'm pretty sure it just gave your sons a thing for goth chicks. Or in my case, goth redheads. Which is ironic considering that, oh uh, yeah. Huh, I realize. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm realizing that uh, there's been a consistent trend. <laughs> oh, God, I don't know if I might, I'll cut this part out. Cut, cut this part out of the review. <laughs> kind of ironic, given that the film goes so hard to differentiate between witchcraft and Wicca. Also, yeah, it's not lost on me that I would later listen to Nightwish, and still do. So from here, our gang splits up in the usual fashion. That, that you always pair off with Daphne, Fred. Jeez, can a guy not have a type? Velma's group is forced to split up again as Shaggy and Scoop tail the mayor, while the former investigate the shack he was in. Meanwhile, Fred and Daphne follow Thorn, who splits off from her bandmates. Are you sure you're not just stuck on Thorn, Freddy? Jeez, can a guy not have a type? Inside the mayor's shack, a still warm cherry picker is found while Thorn consumes some sort of potion. Shaggy and Scoob come up short as all they get is another encounter with the witch. Everyone regroups at the concert when the witch appears once more and is promptly taken out. No! So the mystery comes to a close. We learn that Thorn's father, McKnight, was the witch who used the band's pyrotechnics to create the illusions of fireballs. The cherry picker was used to simulate the witch's flight, and everyone but the Hex Girls and Ravencroft were in on it. I, I, I'm very disappointed in you, Mayor, and all of you. Well, hold on now, Ben. This, <laughs> this ain't the worst thing Neil Ross has done for money. You may be thinking this is the end, and it's a bit anticlimactic. That's because it is. But with just under 30 minutes left, there's a bit more coming up. Turns out the construction of the village unearthed Sarah Ravencroft's grave, and the shoe buckle Shaggy has isn't a shoe buckle. Oh shit, Sarah was a Lovecraft fan way back in the day. That's an evil book, isn't it? It's a spell book. Yeah, so Ben has gone rogue, and the enemy powers are flowing through him. Turns out he orchestrated the whole thing, from the jobbers at the start to right now. Which is cool, but I do find it funny that if he learned about the Mock Witch first, he would have saved a ton by just inviting them like a normal mystery caper. Eh, what's done is done, and we have some curry ham. Dreadful darkness, hear my cry. Bring back one who cannot die. Fun fact, that is his favorite line ever, according to the actor. So yeah, we now have the actual witch to deal with. And there's at least two jokes that really tickle my fancy. One where Ben reveals he brought her back in the modern day. Modern? Not much seems to have changed. And the second is just a fun Wizard of Oz gag. What was that? You're not melting! Like it worked in the Wizard of Oz! Oh, and the giant pumpkin that attacks is voiced by Brian Cummings, who, yes, is a Metal Gear VA. And the voice behind Sokolov. Is the Western VA seen that small or something? Well, Sarah Ravencroft VA trusts McNeil is in any of the Metal Gear, so... Eh. Well, she's not in them. Yet. Well, the evil witch is evil and turns on Ben, who tries at the last minute to imprison her. Through the power of Thorn's 10% Wiccan blood, they manage to use a spell book to return Sarah to her confinement. At least she has some company. Oh, and this Necronomicon is not flameproof. Also, the outro is a nod to the original idea of the TV show, as originally the gang was meant to be a band. Interesting. So that was Scooby-Doo and the Witch's Ghost. Releasing in the USA October 5th, 1999, the latest release would be Sweden, December 7th, 2002 on TV. Bit of a date for the season the movie goes for. The film is fun, it's a solid Scooby-Doo tale that isn't exactly as good as the prior film. So when the studio brought on the two writers, Rick Kopp and David Goodman, it was because they wanted a less dark tone compared to Zombie Island. Which is odd, since 
that's what helped sell it. Yes, it may have been a bit frightening, but it wasn't anything super severe. Kids weren't seeing the exorcist girl do evil shit. The original ending was with the fake ghost, and well, I can't say if it was more elaborated on during the production, I can say that if the film ended there, that would have been disappointing. In fact, that twist was so disappointing that the original crew pushed for and added on the last 30 minutes with the appearance of a real witch. One, because it's kept more in line with the first film theme, and also because just how sucky the original ending was. It's a fine mystery, but pales compared to Zombie Island. Also, another problem I had that may have largely been due to the additional twist was how little the witch interacted with the gang. It chases Scooby and Shaggy enough, but the rest of the gang only sees her for about 20 seconds before taking it down. It comes off really weak, again, compared to the zombies in the prior film. Even the big bad feels off. Now, this could largely be due to her small amount of screen time. It does seem that they try to make it up by having her do a ton of shit during the last third. Meanwhile, the cat people had an entire film to build up to their reveal. The red herrings don't work super well. Again, the characters are fun enough, and the twist of a whole town being behind a scare to make money is cool, but doesn't have as well of a payoff. Ironically, I would have preferred to have seen this without the studio interference. It does seem to return to the tone of Zombie Island come the final third, but overall, it's a bit of a watered-down version. Still superior to the Zombie Island sequel, but that probably will never be on this channel, both because of the copyright hell I get to deal with when it comes to these films, and because it's just a dumb film. This is still a good film, though, and its setting around the fall season makes it a good family film for Thanksgiving. Typically, Thanksgiving horror films are a bit much for small children. This one, however, fits right alongside a helping of pumpkin pie. And it also has the lesson of when people show you ye old drawings and pictures and depictions of people, yeah, whatever they tell you about them, it's most likely the opposite, apparently. Moonscar was a good guy. Ish. Relatively. And Sarah, well, she was a bitch. And a witch. Scooby-Dooby-Doo! <laughs> <laughs>